So this is a Shared Delusion Sprint 4 review. Um, the sprint was three weeks long and lasted uh, from July 17th through today. Um, we completed 116 story points with 125 remaining. There are uh, quite a few in progress. Um, so let's go through and see where they're at. Uh, we've also kind of inventoried where things are at on the platform, but we'll go through those uh, at Monday's planning session. So let's start with the new model policy framework, Sapin. Is Sapin on? Uh, I don't see Sapin. I've got a note from him. He's having trouble um, finding the link. Let me uh, let me send it to him. Okay, why don't we move on to the next item and then we can come back to this. It's happening, it's on. Uniform development environment, Andy? So the main uh, deliverable uh, in this sprint was to get the, was Cord 1401, getting Cord in a Box working with the ink-based build. Um, this was almost done it was working uh, at one point, but then uh, towards the end of the sprint, there was a, a uh, flurry of changes that required rebasing, and that seemed to uh, break what had been previously working, and I haven't quite had a chance to, to dig into that uh, and figure out what the problem is. So um, Core 1401, as I mentioned, is, is almost done. That was the main goal of the sprint, um, things we did get finished is um, cleaning up the vagrant file. This was a prerequisite for uh, 1401. Uh, there was also a minor bug fix. This is Cord 1639, updating the image whitelists and the various um, profiles in the new build system. Um, so I already talked about Cord 1401. The other uh, task in progress uh, was Core 1377, which is basically making people aware of the, the changes uh, coming in the build environment and, and getting feedback. So uh, there is a document that describes some of the changes um, that was done a while ago. This document, I think, maybe needs to be updated because some things were sliding out of the the current um, release plan. Uh, so that document might be a little bit stale. Uh, Zach spent some time with uh, the QA team telling them about the, the new build system. And they have been working on um, uh, updating uh, Jenkins jobs to, to work with the new system. So uh, they seem to be uh, getting on board with with the new system, uh, so that's good. Uh, what hasn't been done yet is sit down with the this, uh, service developers like the M chord and E chord, A chord folks to to tell them about the new build system. Um, so that'll be a a task for the next sprint or or possibly the one after. Not started is uh, Cord 1400, which is uh, getting a full pod build working with, with the make based build system. So that is something that's going to slide out to the next sprint. And my hope is that, that Gopinath and I will kind of work together on that task um, in the next sprint. 
So I think if this shouldn't be much additional work, I think most of the work went into getting cord in a box working. Um, so my hope is it's more a matter of kind of just getting Gopinath up to speed with, with how to build cord um, rather than, than a lot of work. Uh, so that's it. Okay, thanks Andy. Yeah, and if you like, you can cycle back to the previous slide. I'm sorry for entering late. Okay. All right, so uh, 1567 was carried over from the previous print. It was end-to-end -end testing for the new uh, validation framework. Uh, that's done. The big ticket here was pre-implementing the security substrate. So in the previous sprint, we had re-implemented, redone the way security policies are specified and uh, the implementation was auto-generated. Auto this actually stitches that auto, those auto generate, that auto-generated auto code into uh, the system. So it actually enforces those restrictions when you call in via the API. Spent a fair amount of time uh, testing this via API tests. So you know, trying different combinations of uh, entering uh, via the API, accessing objects, to make sure it doesn't work. And I think it's pretty robust. Um, there was also porting the old security policies, uh, specifying them the new way. And there was debugging and end-to-end -end, uh, testing. So that that got done. Um, the one thing that didn't get done, it, it's a big task, and so I've abandoned it for now, is the creation, the automatic creation of uh, security credentials. So when you add a new user um, to automatically figure out what objects, what services, slices, etc., that person has explicit access to and, and to create them. That's going to also require coordination on the UI side and uh, uh, fleshing out the security model uh, more completely. So to, to that end, uh, I've created two um, design documents on the security model of XOS. They're in the shared delusion folder. They kind of um, summarize the state of things right now. So the answer to the question, who can, un who can access what in what context? And this only applies to you know, a small fraction of the models. And we have to figure out, we have to flesh out that story for the rest of the models and you know, figure out what uh, securing them means. And especially with the, with the service tenancy refactoring, there's going to be some thought that goes in there. And uh, auto-creating security credentials will dangle off that. So that's that's it for me on this slide. Hey, Safan, is there any documentation on the new model policy framework yet? Um, it's disconsolidated. So that's actually one of my items for next, uh, I guess, for the next print. So I've got that request from various sources, and I'm going to you know, document this pretty. I'm going to be documenting this next sprint. But there's, there's um, in sort of historical documents that have led to this. You know, there are, there are there's bits and pieces of documentation. There's some documentation in the exproto.md file, and there's some in the security document I put together. But uh, I'm going to be documenting this thoroughly. Very cool. Thanks. Safran, can you go ahead and get a story in place for that as we head into planning? Okay, we'll do. Okay, thanks. Uh, service Tennessee model, Scott? You skipped a slide, but you can oh, come sorry. back to me later. Sorry, I will go back to you. Zach? Um, I, I, these are the tests that I did on the uniform development environment. Um, a lot of them were bug fixes that got added mid thing mid, uh, mid sprint, um, or were prerequisites for making open cloud work. Um, so getting Maven repo working uh, that previously was happening in Gradle. So that was a make based build to get um, the open cloud and um, our code profiles working for um, the virtual install. Um, and then uh, removing hard code use of the Cord Lab was to get was to make it so that um, we had some hard coded uh, domain uses, it. and that was um, changing the config module to allow you to specify a domain. 
the single pod scenario was uh, the mock plus um, uh, mock plus synchronizers support um, in the new build system. Uh, uh, 1597 PLY protobuf, that was a versioning issue that we ran into um, when we bumped the version outside of where it would be referenced inside the um, Exos base container. And 1608 was reliability fixes. Um, we had changed the um, the timeout, uh, the control persist timeout in SSH, which caused some problems with uh, uh, some of the build um, environment and people getting um, um, uh, things where it would hang up. Um, in progress is 1569 uh, auto generating documentation for build system variables. Um, and then the other ones at the bottom, uh, those are all things related mainly to image builder and uh, more documentation fixes. That's it. Okay. Oops. Okay, service Tennessee models. Okay, so Core 1249 was to implement the service dependency models. That was uh, mostly done in the previous sprint, but just needed a little bit of finishing up in this sprint. Uh, 1250 was to implement all of the service instance uh, models. That was uh, service instance interface type, service interface, and service instance link. Uh, the big change there that will impact people is that we got rid of the many-to-one relations, and we now have uh, many-to-many uh, relations through service instance link. Um, and that led to Core 1251, which was to port the existing R Core services over to the new models. And that was primarily revolved around um, those links and uh, needing to rewrite various code that traversed uh, the old style links to do it in the new way. Um, we're also going to have a huge documentation task that's going to come out of this. I haven't created. Um, a story for that yet. I, I don't know if you want that next sprint yen or if you want that in the following sprint when we uh, do documentation and bug fixing, but that's uh, that's going to be significant because we're going to have to write a little bit of a how-to guide on how to uh, migrate services. Um, Cord 1594, uh, Sapin uh, helped out with this one. This was uh, Previously, we had the kind field in the tenant objects, and the kind field would tell you, you know, if you get a generic tenant, what kind of specific tenant it is, and then you would know to look up a BSG uh, tenant, for example, with that same ID. Uh, we've replaced this with a much better mechanism uh, that, that keeps track for each model what its derived class is. So for any model, if you query a base class, you can learn uh, the derived class. Um, so that that was a very uh, very useful feature that we've we've integrated. Will help out not only with service uh, tenancy modeling, but with uh, other places where we use class inheritance as well. Um, I think that's it for this slide. Okay, and then Scott to address your question about documentation. Uh, my preference is we save it for the hardening sprint. I think what we can discuss as part of planning on Monday is. Is there someone else depending on this? My concern is we actually have quite a few things that we're putting into Sprint 5 in order to get to feature complete. Um, so unless there is someone waiting on the documentation, we may want to hold off and just make sure all the functionality is in place. Ideally, I think what we do want to do is make sure documentation is built into each of the features as a criteria to exit it, right? But I think uh, it's something we'll have to plan into the next release. OK, that sounds good. And then uh, service tenancy models again, Matteo? Yeah, that, that's the UI part of it. Uh, so it's still in progress, the design of the new view representing the service graph. Uh, I didn't really got time to start the implementation uh, this sprint. But basically, I'm thinking to uh, merge the two views that we have now uh, in one, because having to confuse people and let the, um, the user manage which data uh, they want to see in that view. Uh, well, what is done is a small update to the existing view to support the new modeling and still work. And that's it. Okay, thanks, Matteo. 
eliminate the excess UI container. Uh, that's still me. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to migrate some feature uh, from the old UI to the new one. Uh, so, Core 1539, um, whenever you specify some uh, some values for a field in Xproto, they are now propagated to the UI and a drop down is generated. Uh, we added the ability in Xproto to hide fields for entire models from uh, the GUI so that that they doesn't get shared. Um, and the big one is was uh, 1338. Uh, we now have support for uh, to navigate uh, related models in the same page, but I'm going to give a demo later about this. Um, still in progress is to create a method to see the basic data uh, when we bootstrap the system. That was before done via Tosca. Now with the new Tosca engine, since it's talking to the core via the API, we need to already have a user there. And that's it. Okay. And then uh, this is one of the features that we were looking at trading off, right? To try to remove hard-coded dependencies. So we should talk about whether the in-progress continues or not. Uh, no, this is not related to the R coded dependency. This is basically yes, too. But it was a feature we were planning to trade off. So, okay. so let's so discuss really it as part of planning. That's really finishing up the Tosca engine. And I, I think we we yeah. need that because we don't want to go into the next release with still having the old Tosca engine. Agreed. And I think the plan was to finish that off and probably get the recipes migrated over if we have time. Um, but the, one of the things we really want to do is remove the hard-coded dependencies. So as part of the planning uh, for Monday, we'll work through that and see what we need to trade off. Okay, thanks, Matteo. So logging, burn. I see you're busy, busily oh. adding updates. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, so um, as far as logging goes, uh, so like, like I said at the uh, the XOS chat this week, um, two to three backends is done. So we're going to be getting log properly uh, and structured <coughs> to a file and console. Um, so finishing up on uh, logging the, the actual box dash backend. Um, Sopin, like I was saying, Sopin is going to help me with that when he comes in on Monday. And we're planning to finish that up by the 12th, which is when he leaves. And so we have, a, we have a time set to work on that um, every day that we call this year. And yeah, that should be done by the 12th. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Baron. And then categorize, unify, and refactor synchronizers. Seth? Um, all right. So the first part of this is started. So I guess just to take a step back there, what we've decided <laughs> for the rest of the release as far as synchronizers go is to you know give the API and the framework a shot in the arm, you know, to figure out what the biggest uh, sources of problems are and to try and patch them as expediently as, as we can. And so these two tasks were, you know, there was uh, the task of getting feedback from people, which I guess I've been doing, you know, over the weeks, uh, even time that I spent in Menlo, uh, and I've been talking to people. And then categorizing these synchronizers and figuring out if we can make some um, strategic strategic changes to sort of cover the use cases in the um, most efficient possible way. Uh, so there's a design document in the shared delusion folder. I think that the to-do list that I've come up with so far, even though this task is incomplete, you know, easily exceeds what. Uh, we can accomplish in this release. So in some sense, you know, this ticket, this pair of tasks needn't be continued too far uh, forward, you know, since we just come up with things that we won't be able to accomplish in this release. So um, there's a there's a document out there, which uh, I guess is maybe half done. Uh, and I'm going to pass that around. And then there's also a list of things that 
uh, I think, you know, based on feedback I've been getting, need to get done. And at some point when that list is complete, I'm going to send a message on DevL or, you know, everybody uh, involved, pe people who've been developing synchronizers to triage the list and figure out what the set of things is we want to accomplish. And that'll be the main task I sign up for in the next uh, sprint. So, so Sapin, just to make sure I understand, so there's a document you're working on that describes like the fuller vision um, of, of what we could do with synchronizers, but will not be able to fit into the current release. And then there's a, a, a smaller list that you're preparing of, of tasks that you think we can get done for this release. Is, is that the right way to think about it? Um, so, we would like a grand vision, and I think that the uh, sort of maybe ambitious uh, objective of this pair of tasks was to try fleshing out as much of that grand vision as possible. Um, but I've taken on these tasks pragmatically, so you know, rather than um, pursuing the perfect way of solving all of the problems, I've been I've also been accumulating things that get in people's way when they develop uh, synchronizers and sort of prioritizing those, right? So when you when you look at the synchronize when you look at the the, the design document, um, the ones that I send around, you probably won't see a satisfying sort of grand vision, but uh, you will see uh, uh, very concrete suggestions for improvements that we can make in this release, but will also help hopefully. Uh, um, you know, a, a kind of maybe get a few steps towards that, that grand vision. Okay. So maintenance, um, I think it's a combo of Scott, Mateo and Sapin. Yeah, the first one is mine, uh, 1519 users not able to get permanently deleted. Uh, this was a race condition between model policies and uh, deleting objects in the API. Uh, if you deleted uh, something very soon after you created it, uh, then it's possible the policy would run and create another dependent object that linked to the one that you were deleting. And then the uh, Reaper would be unable to get rid of them. So this. This fix is, is checked in, but I do need to uh, talk to QA and have them uh, start testing what, what they were testing before that managed to expose the bug and make sure that um, that it's fixed for them as well. Uh, that's it for me. I think it went off again. So um, the next one was a flurry of, mostly a flurry of bugs that emerged when I was assisting the a Accord guys port their monitoring service from uh, 2.0 to 3.0. Uh, the monitoring service has some peculiarities in the way it uses model inheritance. Uh, and there were some use cases that hadn't been tested when, when we released. So there were some minor fixes there. Uh, 16.02 was essentially uh, an, an ambient bug. So when we, when I checked in some fixes, the XOS base build stopped working because some package versions involving Jang, uh, gRPC and uh, Sphinx had updated in the background and needed some random um, changes or sort of random exploration of version combinations uh, to, to make it all work again. The easy way forward there would have been to just upgrade the gRPC package to the very latest version, so from 1.04 to 1.4. But uh, I didn't do that because it's a release stable branch and um, the effects of that could be uh, un unpredictable. And so I, I found the uh, closest versions of the packages that we had previously um, and, and got that working. Um, I guess, um, yeah, up to 1592 is mine. And then uh, maybe the next one's are not yours. 
Uh, yeah, 1552 was um, a small bug in the core builder uh, that uh, wasn't creating uh, an init.py file for a service that were only specifying uh, the exploder file in their onboarding recipe. Uh, Andrea discovered, discovered that and we managed to fix it. And 1515 uh, uh, was a bug in 3.0 in which um, GUI extension were deployed as container, but um, an entry was not created in the data model, so the UI was not loading them. Okay, thanks. We'll move on to OpenCloud, um, Scott and Jack. Sure. So first up, uh, we removed from Sprint uh, 1562, which was to deploy and test the CDN on an open cloud node. Uh, I should say the new version of the CDN, not the legacy software that we've been using in production. Uh, the reason we removed that is just because we weren't ready uh, with open cloud at this time. So we decided instead uh, to go ahead with 1635 and 1636, uh, which was to repair the legacy CDN um and then use that for a demo and those are mainly driven by the need to um both maintain uh, redundancy for the onos uh, packages that we're currently serving on the production cdn as well as to have a demo ready for uh, uh the uh, nsf grant uh that's it okay thanks scott expand qa coverage um oh. uh so what we have down, uh, 15, 13, Jenkins job environment for ng uh, which will trigger a test for every patch submitted to the ng protocol. And uh, 1641, uh, as a follow-up, we uh, proposed a solution to address the security concern of uh, automatically triggering ng fully test on family as root. Um, then 15, 15, 53, we uh, worked on generating GRBC unit test using Excellence JS2. And uh, 1584, update environments use new make system. We updated the Excellence Sanity test, the guys Sanity test job to use uh, the new build system uh, with master branch. And 1554, which is done by the Spiring Key Ready System. I don't know. So it's adding sanity tests for the uh, physical path. And then uh, from 1544 to 1543, this is, yeah, these are done by the Cyanogen to develop and validate tests for scaling with various uh, components. And we have uh, several working programs on the next slide. Um, 15, 54, adding uh, sanity tests to exercise GUI is still in progress. And uh, then also uh, integrating call tester framework to test scale. And uh, 1642, uh, which came uh, in the middle of the screen. Uh, to install, automatically install uh, called on Intel part. And uh, the last one, 1522, uh, change set should not be, should not import with ATD install and remove uh, software and the systems. Uh, also in progress, I guess. And uh, the retrospective problem is we uh, accepted several new requests in the middle of the screen and we created new stories. Okay. Okay, thank you. Fabric features and improvements. Charles? Okay. Um, so, Studio Homing is the, the biggest story we are, we are doing for the sprint. Um, uh, the biggest item right, right here is the uh, integrate um, ECMP path calculation and host handling part. Um, so, um, Sora was right about this in the sprint planning. Um, this is definitely over three points. It's probably five or eight 
but anyway, um, we've identified several issues and um, we fixed some of them. Um, and it's already reviewed. Um, my plan is to push that today so it can get into um, the 111 branch. Um, anyway, um, and then we still have this host de detection part for, for dual home hosts. It's still a work in progress. I want to do more refactoring on this. And also the route handling is still an open issue. Um, and then um, about GCP relay, uh, we are um, doing a lot of refactoring and we now have this new architecture that separates the, the store and the manager. This is already merged and we also uh, implemented the uh, a very nice COI for uh, you know to show you some debugging information. Um, and we are also working with other community members on the DOCP v6 features. Um, so we separate v4 and v6 handler. Um, and then we have this DFCP v6 packet serializer and deserializer ready. Um, and we also have this config change in order to uh, support uh, DOCP v6 and also multiple DOCP servers. It's, it's pending review. Um, and we also do a lot of uh, fixing host location provider. The first one is to support uh, VLAN in the in the DOCP relay scenario. And then uh, we also fix several bugs uh, in order to support, sorry, uh, we fix several bugs and also support uh, V6 in host location provider. This is in any review. And then uh, the wiki documentation is work in progress. Um, and also, as I mentioned, we are right now helping uh, community members on IPv6 multicast feature and DOCP v6 relay features. Um, and also just a, uh, a preview, uh, starting from next sprint, uh, the multicast story and the DOCP relay story will become, become a sep uh, their own separate epic. Um, and the, these epic were mainly driven by the community members. Um, that's it from me. Okay, thanks, Charles. Um, just wanted to note, though, a huge amount of acceptance stories. Um, a lot of them are actually carried over from the previous sprint, so. So they were close to being complete. Um, sorry? Uh, okay. I didn't get the last no. part. The... So a lot of them were carried over from the previous Right. So were they yeah, close I, to being complete? Um, I th I think some of them are, um, but some of them are still uh, in progress because we haven't merged it. Um, there, as you see, you know, a lot of our story are under review right now or reviewed. So okay. um, that's why they're still open and they're mm -hmm. still in progress. Okay. Thanks. Our court, Gemma. Yeah, so the main, call, uh, main task for our code for this sprint was to um, try and deploy Volta on, in the code pod um, and see what the gaps are to, to getting that um, being automatically deployed. Um, so I started by manually deploying it on a compute node um, by just deploying the containers directly on the compute node and attaching them to the integration bridge. Um, and then figured out how to plumb the connectivity through VTN and Fabric um, using a combination of, of uh, putting the right data into XOS to get it to, to pro uh, provision the networks, and then also there's some manual steps that I had to do. Um, and then so I got that connected to the PONSIM OLT simulator, which was connected, connected to the fabric um, like a normal OLT would be. Um, so we have the gate to be end to end there between the OLT and the and Volta. Um, and then going forward, the, the goal is to try and automate um, this provisioning. Um, and so to that end, I started looking at the existing models in the OLT service, um, particularly the access, access agent model, which will be used to deploy uh, Volta um, and figuring out um, what extra data we need to, to add to that model to, to be able to uh, really deploy Volta and get the service chain um, running, basically. That's all. So one of the things you had talked about for Volta was uh, versioning of the apps. Right, so I think David is planning to version the uh, AAA DHCP app. So are you planning to also version the OLT? What do you mean version the OLT? The app 
in our nose, right? So I think there's, we're moving to 1.10. So I think we need to make sure there's coordination um, with cord also as we do that on Volta. Since yeah, yeah. And then yeah. the other thing was versioning of the apps that are being hosted on Onos because they're currently snapshots. Yeah, I think um, probably what we should do is just release all the apps um, but before or, or while we're releasing Shared Delusion, we should release all these apps as 1.3 or whatever version we want, but probably 1.3. Um, because some of them have changed, but some of them probably aren't. But it, but either way, we're using snapshot versions of all of them. So we just just make a release so we can we can tie a shared delusion to that released version, and then going forward, um, if we change the apps, we we can make new releases. But if we don't change them and they give a release, we can just use the the existing version. Okay, so you may want to see. Uh what apps and which ones aren't versioned. So I don't know if David is just doing the one specific to Volta. I mean to, yeah, to Volta. So um, let's work through this. Yeah, right now they're all tied to the same version, but um, they probably shouldn't be. Um, we, sh we should have the ability to release them individually, probably. OK, can you work with David? OK. And then I assume you guys will need to coordinate with Andy. Record. Andrea? Or Mark? Andrea's not here. It's, it's going to be me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. So um, we're really uh, bringing everything together now for, uh, well, in preparation for a, a proper release. Um, so the, the four tasks that we've done is uh, Andrea developed a new Metronet global service, uh, extra service model. Uh, and uh, for this sprint, we worked and, and completed the deployment automation uh, of that service. Uh, secondly, we um, we worked well, spent a little bit of time documenting um, the ONOS part of our carrier Ethernet uh, capability, uh, because basically the, the ONOS app can be used independently, but it's also part of of Cord. So. Uh, kind of in anticipation of people starting to ask questions, uh, how to interact with that specific app, uh, we we took the time and um, and wrote down a few of the you know the feature set and and, and instructions. Um, then we also did some data plane testing um, of forwarding constructs from global to local um, 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 carry Ethernet. Well, I think that has to be CO instead of CE. Uh, from global to local uh, court site, uh, so essentially testing the transport aspect of it. Uh, what's still in progress uh, is the, the very last one in progress, 1326, is the data plane integration and testing between uh, the Ethernet edge and the fabric, which is essentially the, the court chain of the uh, of the data plane. Uh, the reason why we're delayed there is is, and it's really you know it kind of a, a cascade of effects. We had a lot of trouble with um, cord in the box during this um, during this sprint. So uh, you know some of the tasks got delayed, and 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 we tried to you know feed bug reports. I think uh, Matteo mentioned this at least once uh, to the platform guys, but this essentially created for us uh, kind of yeah some a diversion, and, and uh, we lacked the time to to complete everything. Uh, the last part uh, of the done issues or, or tasks is uh, a UI uh, part where uh, Max and, and Theo uh, have worked to get uh, the new global service connected to uh, the UI. Uh, and I think that's about it. Okay, thanks, Mark. I'm cord. Ping ping. Uh, so uh, a lot of tasks this sprint were in preparation for MWC in September. Uh, we added the uh, mobility management and session management services. So that was disaggregating the existing MME service into two core functionalities for vendors who may want either the session or mobility management service, but not both. Uh, we fixed a bug where uh, instances were not created when uh, a tenant was made in the UI. So we just added custom uh, model policy code. Um, for our services, 
and we added a new role to the core in the box uh, build sequence to delete uh, leftover running Nova instances. Uh, we fixed a bug causing the metal as a service uh, build to always fail in our M core in the box script. Uh, we yeah, refactored Intel's demo configuration into Tosca for MWC so they don't have to manually build it in the conference. And then we updated the wiki uh, to keep track of all the changes that we just mentioned, uh, specifically the networks and service deployment pages. And then in progress, uh, we're going to uh, begin building a full M core pod. Uh, and then we want to add the ability to bring up multiple services at once, uh, which is a EPC as a service, so service chain. Okay, thanks. I don't have an update from the Accord folks. Um, the next thing is the performance brigade work. And I added a burn down chart just because it was very amazing. So. We have been very productive in the last few days. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, that, that part is scary, but <laughs> I think it's right, so this, nice. was, this, was, this was performance brigade week uh, at uh, ONF. So uh, Christian and Sai from Intel came down this week, and um, Sai and I worked towards um, adding, doing the software changes for, for integrating DPDK support into the pod, or at least to trying to get a proof of concept together. Um, so we got through pretty much everything on our list. Uh, there were some changes uh, to uh, OpenStack config required, um, some changes to the, the Onos uh, Neutron plugin. Uh, to add uh, port bindings for DPDK interfaces, um, some modifications of the Nova Compute Juju Charm. This was kind of the, the hairiest task, I think. Um, and um, then some, some Cord 1548 is also Charm changes to bind the fabric interfaces to uh, DPDK. And so um, I did an update this slide. It says testing after 1485 and 1548. So um, I finished testing that last night, and they seem to be working, at least in port in a box. So we're not able to actually do benchmarking on, on port in a box, but we can at least make sure that the software runs and sets up the configuration that we expect. And that seems to be the case. So the next step, I think, is to test these changes on a hardware pod and do some performance benchmarking. And I need to reach out to Luca to find out if we have a pod that we can use because the, um, the, the pod that Intel was trying to set up for this doesn't seem to be um, quite working yet. So I think that's it. Okay, thanks, Andy. So we do have a demo, but before that, I wanted to go over uh, Sprint 5 plans. So Sprint 5 is going to start Monday. It's a three-week sprint with the end being feature freeze, and uh, the policy for feature freeze is we're done with code, it's reviewed, it's merged, right? Anything that isn't merged isn't in. Um, I think we've been talking about some integration of other features also for this next release. So we'll work through that on Monday. The sprint planning is um, at 2 p.m. And what I wanted to understand is what brigades are active and what uh, additional sprints do we need to create. So for example, we created a separate performance um, sprint for that team to track their work. And it seems like that's working well. So for the other sprints, are you guys active and Ready to start tracking your work? So hierarchical containers? Yeah. We are ready to start participating in the sprint planning process, uh, starting with this sprint. So Rick McGear, who's the brigade lead, is going to jo uh, join the sprint planning meeting on Monday. And we've got epics and uh, I guess some stories within those epics as well. So we're going to participate. 
So I'll create a separate sprint for you guys. Um, All right, thank you. Containers? Um, we, uh, I, I've been trying to uh, have a chat with uh, David about uh, starting that up. We do have an agenda. The plan is to um, have the first uh, agenda meeting sometime on Tuesday next week. Um, uh, and then basically uh, come up with a bunch of Jira tasks for them. Uh, we don't have them yet. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and create one. And then this way you guys can populate it as part of the Tuesday meeting if you're ready. If not, let me know and I'll remove it and we can figure out when. This way you'll have it in place if you're ready to start adding stories to it. Um, I have set up the Tuesday meeting uh, yeah. for that brigade, so. Yeah, thanks for that. Okay, anything else? I thought there was another brigade. There was a certification one that had a meeting on Monday. Is that one starting up? Anyone know anything about the certification brigade? No. Okay. <laughs> I guess we will not create a sprint for that. I think that's it. Um, so we'll start the demo. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so uh, this is a deployment of Arcord, and but this feature will be available in uh, all the configurations. So, what we added is that if when we navigate to the detail page for any model, we'll now see a list of tab with all the related models. Um, in there, we'll see both one-to-one uh, -one, uh, relations as well as one-to-many relations so you can navigate between the related models uh, way more easily um, we try to differentiate the tabs that have data and the tabs that have not using a different color for uh, the title so you avoid to uh, go by mistake in a tab that doesn't have anything to, to show. And that's basically it. It's, it. It is enabled for all the models. And in case the relation uh, as uh, so some models have um, multiple relation to other model, like for example, the uh, the service are related to service dependencies, both for the provider service and the subscriber service. So we are augmenting the name of the tab, which with the field that is building that that relation. And that's basically the demo. Uh, I've been chatting in these days a little bit with Sap and uh, and Scott and Zach for a requirement on the GUI, but. I just want to um, encourage everyone that has a requirement on the GUI to come and talk to me, so to make it uh, as useful as possible. And that's it. So the way to get help, can we use it in Colors or is it only for Master? Uh, so far, it works on Master. Uh, I can look at how much it will take to port it to 3 Yes, and for example, if we create this, we want to know what's the port connected to it. Right now, we can say it's only just an existing port. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll try to port it back to 3 mm -hmm. Shouldn't be too hard. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, thanks, Matteo. So I think we're done uh, with the review for today. Um, I'll get the viewers kind of closed out, the new one created, and then if you guys can add stories to it, and we'll go over it on um, Monday. Keep in mind, it's the last sprint until Future Free, so uh, we'll have a pretty good discussion on what's in or out, and what's at risk. OK? Thanks, everyone. Bye.
Bye. Bye.